am i audible yeah okay um uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce the speaker uh, with us today today we have with us um, mr ozan bakhivan if i'm spelling it right Uh, yeah, all right. <laughs> thank you very much. He is currently completing his doctorate in clinical and health psychology from University of Barcelona, Spain, on the project topic of a new clinical approach for cancer patients, mindfulness-based CBT, breathing and imagery technique called the swinging effect intervention. He is currently the founding director uh, and a full-time health psychologist in the OZ Psychology Family Counseling Center in Izmir, Turkey. Earlier he has worked as a health psychologist in Baskin University Hospital Turkey and also as a consultant supervisor and professional development group facilitator in a pregnancy and parenting counseling services in Adelaide Australia his work on psycho oncology has been published in various significant publications he is currently a member of the international psycho oncology association turkish psychology association member of world psychiatric association psycho oncology and palliative care group he is uh, is also a member of the british uh, psychological association member of international alliance of holistic therapists and uh, also member of the australian psychology association aps psycho oncology uh we are we are indebted for you to be a part of this uh, session uh, with us and i also would like to welcome our friends uh, who have joined us from various parts of the world especially so i'm really glad to welcome all of you thank you so much sir for coming into our session today thank you thank you for the psychological uh, psycho oncological association and psycho oncology association of turkey for being a part of this series thank you also thank you please sir, you can start yours friends uh, before uh, uh, ozan just a second because we have uh, yeah krishnan sir will give the instructions for the session um before we start the session we would like to have uh, certain instructions to make the zoom session pleasant for all the participants i would like to give you a few instructions please keep the mic on mute mode you can unmute when the name your name is called during the question and answer segment please keep the questions ready and so that uh, the time is not wasted in framing the question at the time of asking we say this program uh, we we say this since the program is for one hour and uh, and you know it will be 40 minutes presentation of the lecture and uh, rest for question and answers you can also send your questions through our chat box or uh, our mail id mywebinarfeedback@gmail.com you can keep your videos on but be uh, follow the uh, online etiquette thank you very much have a great day all right What's well that? thank you very much thank you very much for the warm welcome and i'm also glad to be here although it's virtually it is still very warm welcome so obviously we are here to talk about psycho oncology and that doesn't mean i will be telling every aspect of psycho oncology because psycho oncology is a huge area and clearly i am not going to cover all of it but i believe this presentation will actually give you some idea of what psycho oncology involves and what sort of patients and what sort of clients that you will be dealing with I am trying to get my full screen mode so bear with me. Here we go. I think I did this perfectly fine. Yes, perfect. All right. Let's begin. I put this in every presentation of mine if any of my uh, participants are here from the past they may have seen this slide from the past and now this is the english version because if you are going to talk about psycho oncology we need to focus on the patient not the disease because when we focus on the patient that means we are going to learn a lot from the patient and disease will come next because disease doesn't define our patients this is the first uh points that i would like to make so psycho oncology is not a made up word 
It is actually defined by the APA, American Psychological Association. I would like to read through, you may also read. Psychoncology is the study of psychological, behavioral, and psychosocial factors involved in the risk, detection, course, treatment, and outcome in terms of survival of cancer. The field examines responses to cancer on the part of patients, families, and caregivers at all stages of the disease. Talking about the disease, we may have participants with us who may know someone who have cancer or who may actually are cancer survivors or maybe they are currently under treatment. Please don't take anything personally. Whatever we are going to say in this here, this is for the health professionals intent. So please make sure of that one. And as you can see, psychology does not only uh, focus on the patient, but also the caregivers. So what is actually cancer? It is a disease, we all know that it's a deadly disease, some says, but most of the time it is no longer deadly if we treat it right and if we catch it in the right manners and the right time. And cancer in a nutshell, it is that abnormal cells can form an invasive, we call it malignant tumor, which can invade and damage the surrounding areas, spread to other parts of the body, which we call metastasis, and obviously it may cause death. Not all tumors are invasive. Some are benign, which is in good manners, and they do not usually spread and rarely life-threatening. So when we say cancer, that doesn't mean all deadly. Some are friendly. Cancers are distinguished from each other by the place in the body, and in which the disease begins. For example, it can be on the lungs, it can be on the breast, it can be on the ovarians, in any part of the body, it can happen. And the relevance, psycho-oncology addresses the two major psychological dimensions of cancer. First, we come with the psychological response of the patient, and of course their families, because it doesn't stop just with the patient. It comes with the caregivers. And I give you a tip. Usually the caregivers are the one that most get affected from this disease. And the psychological, behavioral, and social factors that may influence the disease process. It is not always about when they learn about the disease. It is also how it progresses and how it will affect their behavioral and also social environment as well. As you can see on the slide, it is biological, psychological, and social. As I said earlier, how many of us have been touched by cancer? I am maybe 99% sure that, you know, this 99% of the people are watching right now have been touched by cancer. It can be your loved ones, it can be a friend, it can be your relative, it can be your family member, or even this can be you. That cancer has passed in our lives. All right, now, I am trying to get my full screen because I'm going to read through this to get this more effective. All right, first, let's imagine you receive a cancer diagnosis and are facing an uncertain future. Um, just the thing, uh, Vina, how can I get my full screen? Because every time a participant trying to do something, I get my screen covered. Is there any way to get my full screen? Um, can you guys help me out in, with the technical matter, please? 
Yeah, thank you very much. Ekta. 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 Anyone? <laughs> Uh, so it's because actually you made the co-host to uh, share the presentation, and okay. we are taking care of that. So we are just letting people in. So please yeah. bear with us. Uh, we'll have oh, to make okay. it. That's why. Right. Okay. Thank okay. You. Thank you very much. So let me let me know when I can continue. I think I I think it will be over by five minutes or so. Okay. And my apologies from the participants they are waiting. I'm trying to make it a, as much effective it can be. Just bear, oh, hold on. I am trying to do something here. Uh, if I can get. Well, how about I continue? Because I don't want to take much off of this time. Is all right? You can I continue? Can, you can continue, also, so that we will okay. sort it out. We'll sort it all right. Out. Thank you. All right. All right. Let's begin. So, first, let's imagine you receive a cancer diagnosis. God forbid. But you are going to face an uncertain future and must begin an invasive and demanding treatment regime. Suffer symptoms and side effects that cause you significant physical discomfort. This is when you receive the cancer diagnosis. Will you be able to continue work or study considering the time consuming nature of your treatment, plus the physical symptoms you suffer? Will you be able to continue to work or study? Who will be paying for your bills? Buying the groceries, taking care of your home, drive you to your appointments if you can't drive yourself. What impact will this have on your family? What extra responsibilities will they be required to take on? This can be practically Financially, emotionally, what does your romantic relationship will look like? How will you manage your own concerns in addition to your family concerns? What activities do you enjoy doing in your leisure time now? Will you be able to continue this during your illness? What activities will you do for fun? Will you have the energy or even desire to get out? Will you be able to maintain your social relationships? Will they survive? How will you feel among your healthy friends at this time? How will you cope emotionally? Now, psycho-oncology kicks in. Imagine these, all these things happens to you and how will you cope emotionally after all? And now I would like to continue with how the psychological response to cancer may happen. A common psychological reactions can be Starting from the diagnosis, it can be anxiety, anger, shame, depression, denial, fatalistic beliefs, grief, loss, any kind of concerns. But clearly, please take this very carefully, all those em emotions doesn't have to happen in regular or also they doesn't, you know, they don't have to happen altogether. 
they may some some of these emotions may not even be there and after the diagnosis clearly we have treatment in treatment progress we may have anxiety which cannot be controlled fears about the treatments and the um, anxieties related to treatment exaggerated pessimism the pessimism level may be higher than expected also the passivist uh, leading to non-compliance with health protective behaviors which means they may reject the treatment and as a psycho-oncologist you have to have understanding about these expected emotional um, outcomes and also one of the most important concern is body image depending on your cancer type for example breast cancer you may have body image concern because of the mastectomy they they may uh, experience mastectomy means is a surgery removing the breast it can be full mastectomy meaning both of the breasts will be removed or partial or half mastectomy which is partial removal or half of the breast uh, removal uh, can be explained as such you need to have the medical terminology familiarizing which means you need to know what medical terminology they might use uh, because the patient may come to you with with full medical terminology and you may just stood there and it's like oh, what is this person talking about because in usual uh, social work psychology counseling we don't usually learn medical terminology unless you specialize in such a discipline as psycho-oncology. So once you are familiar with those terms, then your patient or your client can be more trusting to you and not to you, also the things that you say and the suggestions that you could make. They will respect you more more than a regular psychologist or social worker because you are a psycho-oncologist. All right, and obviously our uh, reactions to cancer doesn't stop with diagnosis, doesn't stop with treatment, and it goes after treatment too. And we call it remission time. And during this time, fear about cancer recurrence, deliberately missing checkups because they may fear about cancer recurrence. They are afraid of learning the result. And body image concerns, again, do not stop because after treatment, the scar is actually there unless you get a clearly a surgery, a plastic surgery. And this is debatable about plastic surgery. And as a psycho-oncologist, you should have the place to discuss such issues with your client. Also, work romantic life adaptation issues also uh, can be an issue here because after treatment, usually many participants, uh, I mean, many, uh, because I was checking the participants thing comes up, um, because of the um, uh, patient's life balance doesn't just get into, um, uh, get into on its way right after. It takes time. And please do not assume as you will um, diagnose your patients considering the psychopathological uh, ways. Cancer patients are out of the loop. Please get this very clearly here because cancer patients should not be considered as psychopathological uh, pathway. Their concerns, their fears, their depressive their depression symptoms or anxiety symptoms are related to an organic reason, which is cancer. If they never had cancer, they would never have felt such way. So please distinguish these two ways, having cancer, having depression, having no cancer and having depression. They are two different things. I am also checking the time. Okay, I better hurry up. So psychological response to cancer relationship changes across broad range of cancer and treatment types and changes in romantic relationships that I 
uh, mentioned. Um, also, you need to know not all changes can be negative. Half of these changes can be positive because from my experience, I know um, from four different countries that I have worked at um, in Australia, Spain, England, and now in Turkey, knowing half of my patients, if they had any family issues or relationship issues, and they were about to break up or they were about to divorce, they actually stick together and their relationship improved because of cancer. So make sure you make this realization to your patients because they all perceive cancer as a negative aspect that happened to their life. And psycho-oncologist, we don't just go with the patient, we also examine uh, our patient's family structure in terms of macroculture, microculture, that including ethnicity, faith, and values in the community, how they see cancer, is it a, a faith that they, have, uh, they may have, or it is something that they need to fight against. We need to understand that. And medical treatments, there are various approaches now happening is 2020 now. And in this age, we have a lot of treatments available uh, medically and also psychologically too, which are evidence-based. For example, surgery for medicals and radiotherapy and chemotherapy and hormone therapy. And I didn't mention it here, but we also have immunotherapies that not many countries are receiving immunotherapy. I'm aware of that, especially developing countries are not receiving much of these immunotherapies. They are not covered by the government, but slowly it is getting wider around the world. I only would like to mention here because the hormone therapy particularly I would like to mention Hormonal therapies can affect psychological moods. When someone is under hormonal therapies, you should be also uh, assessing the patient how much hormonal treatments they receive, how were they before the treatment emotionally, and how they will be after the treatment, and how currently they are. You need to have to distinguish and discuss this with your patient because once they see the differences about themselves because they only see themselves negatively for that matter you need to uh, make these distinguishes with your patient yes that this is me um, in the picture with my patient some years ago um, in the clinical interview we take biological um, history, psychosocial history, you can read through, I'm not going through all. And also the current stressors that that might have, we cannot guess what a patient can go through. So stop guessing, start letting, uh, getting to know your patient. Because every patient is different. Their perspective will be different to someone else that you see in just an hour ago. Because just an hour ago, patient was very optimistic. That doesn't mean this new patient will be very optimistic about their cancer diagnosis as well. This may, um, this may be different because of their age, gender, marital status, if they are single, if they are married, if they are recently got married, if they are very uh, later in, the, in their uh, marriage, all these factors are very significant that you need to assess very carefully, carefully. All right, so what do we actually aim from psycho-oncological interventions? We decrease distress, assist with adjustment to diagnosis, increase quality of life, address body image concerns, address concerns about cancer recurrence, pain management, tackle depression, anxiety, improve family communication, explore grief and bereavement. If in the case of, if you lose the patient, our job does not end. We continue to work with the family. 
because when the grief agreement continues, our job continues too. Because during this illness time, when the illness was progressing, you were there for them. So you are the best person as a professional who can help those family get through the grief and the bereavement process because you were there since the beginning. Please make this um, distinguished very clearly and very carefully. It is because if we unfortunately, if we ever lose our patience, our job does not end. Please be careful here. We continue to work. All right, so what do we actually do? We assist oncologists and other healthcare professionals to de deliver bad news. What is bad news? It's can the cancer diagnosis. <clears throat> So we actually assist them. To prepare a common ground when talking about death, because we have palliative care and we have hospice care, which I will discuss later if we have time. To prepare for possible complications during the cancer journey. If we uh, prepare for possible complications during the cancer journey, that means we will be elevating anxiety about cancer. If we let them know what possible outcomes they might experience, that means those people will feel less anxiety because they will say, ah, oh, yeah, my psycho-oncologist mentioned about this or my oncologist, my nurse, my social worker has mentioned such complications uh, during the illness. So it is normal. What we are doing here, we are normalizing the process. And what else we do? We prepare for consultations with oncologists because patients unfortunately have lots of questions and some of them are burning questions. We need to get these burning questions prioritized. Once they ask these burning questions, their anxiety level decreases dramatically to act as a referral point for socio-economical and psychiatric needs. Because as a psycho-oncologist, we cannot uh, cover all of these aspects. We need expert support. And also to support adherence and compliance for prescribed treatment in case of their rejecting the treatment. And to support carers. Our job does not only involve with patients, but also caregivers as well. And don't forget, you are dealing with human beings. They are human after all. They are not just patients. They are not just ill people. They are human. They need to be remembered in special days. Especially when this comes from a health professional like yourself, it means a lot to them. If you say, oh, hello, Mr. Smith, happy birthday. I'm, because every time you call them for follow-up, they may think, oh, he is calling for me for my illness. But when you surprise them, hello, I'm calling to celebrate your birthday, happy birthday. And if you give them a nice gesture with like very enthusiastic point, imagine the happiness you may give them uh, over the phone. I will quickly pass this through, uh, but you need to assess them based on evidence-based strategies and conduct interventions. What are evidence-based? We do not have the luxury to experiment on our cancer patients. Why we are not exper experimenting anything with them if they are not evidence-based? Let's say, let's try this technique because I remember uh, one of my PTSD symptom patient was uh, really benefited this. No, these people are cancer patients and either they may not have uh, much time to live, they may not have the energy to go through with intensive intervention, and also they are cancer patients, they should not be assessed as a normal psychopathological uh, way. You should assess them separately with mindful way. Why we are conducting psycho-oncological interventions? Because we are trying to help government to save money. 
because they are paying lots of bills and everything space you can see these um references i know they are kind of outdated but that means even though 20 years ago they were getting a uh, benefit imagine in 2020 now how much benefits they can get considering um the um, effective treatments we conduct, which are evidence-based. Um, the multidisciplinary approach in cancer care is crucial because it is not only psych-oncologists that we work with, it is also the nurse, oncologist, a patient, social worker, and don't forget, caregivers. The carer must always be included in this multidisciplinary uh, frame. So, Let's start with the carers. I am not going through too much detail. I am only going to give them very much needed information because we are running out of time. They're usually feeling fearful. And when we talk about fearful, that not always including about treatment and prognosis, but also including about themselves. Imagine they are 12 years old carer, which I have had. Uh, when I was in the UK. So when I talked to the pay, uh, caregiver, which are the 12 years old kid, yeah, that's right. Uh, he was telling me, I am afraid if I lose my um, grandma, yeah, that was a grandma, uh, who will look after me? Because there were no parents. And he was the only person living with the grandparent. And so what will happen to me? You see that the fear is not about the treatment. It is not about the um, 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 side effects of the treatment, etc. It is still about the illness, but illness consequences. So make sure you are not guessing what is happening, but make sure you are assessing everyone individually. And also, one of the very major thing is not knowing what the future holds. This is not only for caregiver, uh, caregivers, but also for the patients as well. Just one thing here I would like to uh, go through very quickly. I also make this underlined here. Some carers feel more in control when you give them too much information because they want to know what is happening to them and what future will bring to them. You are not a psychic, but we know from the fact that if someone receiving chemotherapy in certain, and receiving certain uh, medication, they are going to lose their hair. We know that from a fact. 95% of our patients lose their hair, and if you prepare them for such consequences, they may, um, look after themselves accordingly. They may get precautions because we are not psychic, but I always make this joke. I don't care. I was like, I know I may act and I may sound like a psychic, but this might happen to you. And then so, and make sure you say this in a very rightly manner, because as I said earlier, some people want to know what is going to happen to them. And some other people, they don't really care because they may think it is overwhelming already. There are two reasons for that. Either they are not um, readily available and they are not uh, able to admit and receive this information yet. They are not ready yet. Or they just think they are very fatalistic and they're very, um, I don't know, just, just, very faithful to illness and they trust their doctors and medical professionals. They just go with the flow, okay? And they don't want to learn anything. They just say, yeah, take me. Do whatever you want. Yeah, I sign everything. Yeah, I have seen those patients too. All right, anger and frustration. And they are usually family concerns and um, their expectations as well that cause anger and also anger about um, why this is happening to me and why this is happening to us. You know, someone else was having, I don't know, three package of cigarettes um, every day and I never smoked in my life. 
why they don't get cancer, but why I am receiving this cancer diagnosis. This is very uh, stereotypical um, way of blaming themselves or you know, getting angry at themselves. Um, just a, um, one example that I wanted to say. <clears throat> you can read through here as well. Okay, next, loneliness. Because they may think um, no one will understand them. This is one of the first very common thing. And the, another one is because of the um, cancer treatment, they may not have the energy to uh, give, um, to socialize or be other people. Another thing is getting infection because they are very prone to uh, infection diseases, uh, like getting flu, for example, because their immune system is quite down and lower than an average person. For that reason, it is highly um, advised for those patients to not to be in a crowded places, always use a mask. Yeah, always use a mask, like in a pandemic. So I believe they are quite happy right now about using a mask because everyone else is using. What happened now is normalizing. Remember, normalizing is the key word here. I have mentioned this normalizing a few times already. How much we normalize this illness, how much we normalize the treatment procedures, that means we are winning, okay? And stress is in every other illness or every other uh, environmental factors that we receive. Stress is a common problem for all of us, but stress can be distinguished for cancer patients because their stress level actually affects their cancer. How it might affect their cancer? Because a uh, high stress level increases, um, uh, sorry, uh, high stress level is affecting immune system. The less stressed you are, the stronger immune system that you might have. All right, loss and grief. This is unfortunate event now. We are coming at the end of my presentation. And loss and grief following a, a diagnosis of cancer. Clearly, loss of an enjoyable part of their relationship with the unwell person is one thing. And sense of longing for missing parts of their life. This is not only loss about one person is dying. It is also a loss when they enjoy going to school, when they enjoy going to movies, cinema, I don't know, playing cricket. You guys play cricket too, I know, because I'm Australian too. <laughs> anyway, so guys, we are talking here about how much you will be distancing yourself from your enjoyed activities. They are also loss. And the guilt obviously attached to it. Guilt is something to, uh, one, sorry, wanting to break from caring. Being well while um, you are actually a um, person they are caring for is sick. As a carer, you cannot do that because you're, you're as a carer, you want to go out, socialize, you want to meet with your friends. No, you cannot do this because your mom, your father, your romantic relationship, etc. You know, it's sick there and you need to take care of that person. But if you're a carer, please also make sure you take time for yourself. I always give this example. You know, we all go to fly somewhere else. What they say at the, in the airplane. First, use the oxygen mask to yourself and after the loved ones after your child, after your children. But first, in the case of emergency, use the oxygen mask to yourself. So make sure you care for yourself first, and then you care for your uh, loved ones later. And obviously satisfaction is another me uh, meta here. The much appreciation you receive, the better um, uh, care you provide. I am not going to talk much about this. And obviously, in terms of helping a carer, the common ways here and assist to give the carer perspective, release some of their worries and frustrations, acknowledge their feelings because they want to be understood, 
online blogging goods, but make sure they don't copy everything from online. One um, disease is not the same as uh, any other disease. And also challenge self expectations is I must be a perfect carer. No, there is no such perfect carer in the world. They have to care for themselves, they have to care for other things, and they also care for their uh, loved ones' cancer. Okay? I am going to skip pretty much. Let's see. Oh, all right. Um, clearly, how, I'm how am I communicating with you right now? Through online, right? Internet. You let them and encourage them to use technology to stay in touch with others. Where physical travel and time is not possible, like a pandemic, I am saying, the cancer patients are actually adapting this pandemic stage and pandemic process uh, quite easily because they are experienced. And we all are with non-cancer people are actually uh, trying to adapt this new normal life. And the palliative care, I would just uh, would like to just make one distinguished uh, difference here because palliative care is usually mistaken with um, hospice care. Palliative care is um, obviously doesn't uh, treat the patient, but it relieves symptoms by the cancer patient uh, for the cancer patient, and that means according to uh, World Health Organization, they uh, palliative care starts from the diagnosis of the cancer, but hospice care doesn't start from the diagnosis of cancer. Hospice care uh, starts at the end of uh, terminal a terminal stage. What is terminal stage means is the end of lifetime. So we know there is no more cure available for that specific uh, patient then we refer them to hospice care. Palliative care is part of hospice care, but hospice care is not part of palliative care. I just wanted to make these differences uh, here because many, even the healthcare professionals are confused. And let's see if I didn't mention anything else. Okay, yep. In palliative care, it can be physical symptoms, psychosocial uh, symptoms, or spiritual problems, including pastoral care. They should, uh, they can receive in palliative care. Okay, a study conducted in the USA. I'm getting uh, very end of my uh, presentation now. Bear with me. All right. Um, if you if you don't communicate properly with your patients, they go other doctors, they go other health professionals to ask these questions. Then what happens? You increase the job load for governments and you increase the job load for health professionals. If they receive very satisfactory answers from you, that means they are not going to seek other um, health professional advice. So make sure you help because don't forget as a psycho oncologist, you are making the connection between your patient and the doctor, okay? Because talking ill is different than talking about illness. I'm repeating this again. Talking ill is different than talking about illness. And I would like to conclude with my presentation by this quote, medical support keeps patient alive, but psychological and social support keeps patients alive. Well, I would like to thank you all for listening and being in such environment with me. We are 100, over 150 participants. I think we made through quite good. Uh, thank you, Osan. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation on the enter psychosocial care of cancer. You did justice uh, to your presentation, I could say that. Uh, and uh, I am sure many of the youngsters would be taking their careers in psycho-oncology. Thank 
you so much and thank you participants uh, we have from all over the globe we had rodbin campus also there and uh, many from uh, other parts of uh, i mean from turkey from south america and uh, thank you so much ozan for that uh, wonderful presentation now we have uh, i thank you question and answer sessions uh, participants whoever have questions kindly raise your hands or you can type in the chat box uh, we have a few questions in the chat okay a few want to go through like if the mother has mastectomy yep. are there chances the doctor the daughter also gets uh, a cancer that was a question from madhavi ma'am so i didn't get it so uh, the mother has mastectomy yes. and i didn't get the rest Mother underwent mastectomy. Are there okay. any chances the daughter too can get cancer? Oh uh, no! I don't. I don't like. There is no such thing. Cancer is not um, infectious. Uh, it's not contagious. So no one can get cancer by touching or getting contacted with the blood or any sort of uh, form from the patient. or patient caregivers so it is not a contagious disease uh, so please don't be scared to touch them <laughs> if this is, did i understand the question correctly yeah uh, next you. question is like uh, hair loss is quite common when a patients undergo chemo and radiation therapy so once the treatment stops uh, will they get back their hair will the hair grow that's a question from dr matilda okay Okay, so um, I'm a psych oncologist, but don't forget, I am not an oncologist. So this question should be referred to, um, you know, radiologist, a radiologist, the specialist uh, medical professionals, or their oncologist. But we are not psychics, and I'm talking about um, based on experiences. Yes, usually the uh, hair grows back. and usually those hairs sometimes grows as a curly hair if they used to have a, a normal hair you know straight hair sometimes they can grow as a curly so this might be shocking but many patients love it so thank you so the answer is yes <laughs> yes uh, we have a few participants who want to ask the questions so i'll ask them to go one by one uh, ashrafi can you please unmute yourself and ask the question ashrafi Ashrafi Okay uh, we have a question from Malar Kodi ma'am Malar Kodi ma'am can you please go ahead with your question Participants who are on uh, the session our session is a uh uh Malar Kodi ma'am Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. yeah. Thank ahead. you, sir. It was a wonderful presentation. Um, I have a question that uh, you said uh, uh, the symptoms. You know, all the symptoms, which psychological symptoms, are tightly related to the pathology which is there in the body. So the cancer is going to be an existing problem. So, and then in that situation, we are giving them counseling and treatment, right? So. Uh, which methodology you know there are a lot of methods available so which methodology did you really use or which methodology is very useful in these situations like there is gestol there is behavior therapy so is there anything okay. in particular okay one size doesn't fit all so don't trying to learn one model and trying to apply this is one mistake that many of my colleagues do and this is one of the advice that i give my students as well don't trying to for example the emdr for example uh eye movement uh, you know emdr right so many patients may benefit from emdr for example but that doesn't mean all patients will benefit from this so trying to learn many techniques as possible because as i said earlier one size doesn't fit all try to assess your patient what is most needed what is you are you know you majority of people here from india 
I know Indian people are very famous for their mindfulness techniques, right? Yoga, mindfulness, spirituality, etc. So maybe you are uh, assisting this patient and thinking, oh, mindfulness will work for this patient. No. They have to be assessed accordingly and individually. Once they know, uh, once you are confident that this patient will you know, uh, receive great benefit from mindfulness, then apply mindfulness. There is no one size fits all. Thank you. Thank you, Wilson. Uh, next question is from Abhi Shankariman. Abhi Shankariman, can you please go ahead with your question? Yeah. Hello? Hello. Am I audible? Yeah. Yes. So it, was a great, it was a great presentation and uh, my question is very simple. How do we prevent uh, getting cancer? Because most of the time it's the stress which is the major root cause for cancer. How do we prevent getting it? Okay, so unfortunately, I cannot give you a simple answer as your simple question. <laughs> this is one thing. However, there are possible prevention ways that I cannot say if you do this, you cannot cancer. You, can, you cannot get cancer, but there are some prevention ways that you can do self care for not uh, prone to cancer. I might say. So that means you may not likely receive cancer diagnosis if you do self-care treatments. Because, you know, we are mostly healthcare professionals here. Make sure you spare some time for you. And I would like to remind all of you, all of you actually did something for yourself today. That you all guys have been in this educational webinar. And this was for you. This was for your own growth. And this was for your own self-development. So you did something for yourself today, but you should do this regularly. This is my only advice. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you Abhiman. Uh, thank you, Osun. The next question is from Satya Bama. Satya Bama, ma'am, please go ahead with your question. Hello. Hello. Uh, yes. Sir, question is, see, uh, as a psycho oncologist, we are going to help the clients in the terminal stage of their life. That is, they are going to die or anything. So, what are the special qualities required for the counselors? Those who are going to help them. That is, psycho oncologist. Is there any special qualities needed? Yes. Uh, Some uh, one. There is. There is one answer to this one, and I think the only answer could be. The only quality a psychologist must have is empathy. Make sure you distinguish your sympathetic feelings and make sure you use it empathetic. Okay. okay? Um, I didn't mention in my presentation because the difference with empathy and sympathy could be a whole lecturing uh, topic. But there is a uh, very distinguished difference between them okay but my answer is make sure the empathy uh, relationship could be established with this patient okay thank you sir thank you thank you thank you, thank you ma'am uh, thank you Osan. Osan, can you suggest uh, a few courses which can be pursued in psycho oncology many are requesting to help courses on psycho oncology well, the courses on psycho oncology can be different. Um, in the, you know, this differs in every country. In Canada, in um, US, and in the UK, there are postgraduate courses, and some newly developed uh, postgraduate courses also available in Australia. I don't know in India, obviously. Um, and I'm saying these things are in English. That's why I'm saying it. Uh, and I think recently um, the Canadian university, uh, one of the Canadian universities are offering online training, but it is a post-graduation form. You know, it is not just like a week or few days course. It is a whole degree course. And I think recently it's been available online, uh, but it's quite expensive to be honest. Thank you. Uh, 
and we have another question like uh, how to deal with caregivers who sometimes try to threaten the patients to follow certain instructions like to stick on to the treatment or medication like is there anything that we could do to deal with such caregivers okay are we talking about adherence uh, difficulties with adherence to treatment yeah adherence to treatment or to take the medication sometimes the patients won't be okay uh, i mean yeah they yeah make sure understand. yeah make sure you ask the reason why as simple as it gets why don't you want to take this medication or why don't you want to go to your appointment why don't you want to receive your chemotherapy the answers to this question may uh, build your way for treatments because some people may think um oh, i don't want to receive chemotherapy because it makes me sicker i feel more sick you know what i mean that can be the their reason another reason is like um i am 75 years old um i don't want to live another 10 20 years you know my life expectancy is that much and i don't want to live ill so this is perspective as a psychologist make sure you provide the perspective because you are a source of perspective as any other mental health practitioner okay you are providing them perspectives have you have you thought about this way have you thought about receiving this chemotherapy because of this 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 such uh, productive questions may lead to um, answers for them and also for carers as well. Thank you. Uh, there Thank is you. another question from Carla. What's your opinion? A psycho-oncologist must be a clinical or health psychologist? Or, uh, Carla, can you be specific with your question if you are there? Carla Gagontana. Ma'am, are you there? I mean, uh, I think she, she wants to ask like whether a psycho-oncologist must be a clinical or health psychologist or anyone from men, mental health uh, uh, who gives mental health interventions can pursue psycho-oncology. Okay. Uh, my answer, okay. My answer is uh, yes and no. I can... Uh, surely and very confidently say that it just one streamlined psychologist, social worker, counselors, nurse or medical doctors can not be a psycho-oncologist. They need additional training. This can be a master's in clinical psychology, master's in health psychology. Those things must be specialized in psycho-oncological perspective. I know health psychology, cancer is mandatorily uh, taught, taught at universities. But for clinical psychology, it is elective. So make sure, you know, you take what is relevant for this field. So my answer is yes and no. Thank you. Uh, next thank you. Yes, thank you, Ozan. There is a question from uh, Madhavi Ma'am. Also, sorry, sorry, Vina. I would like to add one thing. If you are just as, let's say, because I'm a psychologist, uh, let's say you are just a psychologist, don't think you are going to deal with cancer patients and their caregivers. This is not because you will harm your patients or caregivers. Let's put them aside. This is for you, for your own safety. Because dealing for such fragile, uh, when I say fragile, you know what I mean? When you deal with such fragile patients, it is bad for you. You will be getting compassion fatigue. You will feel lots of other symptoms like PTSD symptoms. Imagine someone just dies, um, just because that happened to me. Um, I talked to one of my patients a few days before and then I called for a follow up. And their daughters, you know, picked the phone. I said, like, oh, hi, can I speak to her? I was like, oh, unfortunately, I lost my mom. I just talked to her two days ago. If I wasn't trained in this field, this might 
traumatize yourself as a health professional. So make sure you protect yourself before anything else. Okay, now we can go on the next question. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for completing that. And uh, next question is from Madhavi ma'am. Ma'am, Madhavi ma'am, can you please go ahead with your question? Uh, yeah. Good evening, hello. sir. Yeah, hello. Happy evening. A really very informative session. My question, sir, like uh, mother has undergone mastectomy. It was not about contagious or anything I was asking. Is there huh. any genetic condition? Is daughter going to uh, get the same uh, the type of cancer or some other type of cancer? Is there any genetic okay. condition? Okay. All right. We know that it is, well, as I said in the very beginning, this is an oncological topic. It is not a psycho-oncological topic, but based on the researches that I know, um, it is in your genes. That means, that doesn't mean you will have 100% get cancer or same cancer or different cancer. That means the chances are more than someone who never had cancer in their family. Okay, but okay. that doesn't mean they will get cancer 100%. This is a no. Okay. What precautions one can take to uh, help themselves? If they have such fears of getting cancer because their mother is cancer, state the fact, depending on their uh, educational background, if they're uh, highly educated, teach them. Psychoeducation is what works better for those people. If they are not well educated, give them visual cards. Show them, you know, if they are not highly educated or if they are not receiving at least high school education, you treat them as how you conduct um, assessments with children. This is most okay. helpful with them. Hopefully okay. that answers your question. Thank okay. you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Yeah. Thank you Thank so you. much. Uh, Ozan, uh, no words to express our gratitude uh, for uh, giving this wonderful session. And uh, I request another good friend, Rodwin, Rodwin Campos, to give the feedback and Suresh Kumar sir to place a vote of thanks. Rodwin! Rodwin <laughs> Amiga! Yes. <laughs> pleasure uh, meeting Rodwin on this platform. Rodwin, you are unmuted. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hello. No, we cannot hear you. Not audible, Rodwin. Not audible. Now, did you hear no. me? Yes, 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 yes. Yes, good. Thank you very much for the excellent presentation. Thank you, Vena. Well, I'm so happy to see you again. And I'm glad to see the presentation. Thank you very much. Here is so early. He's here is six thirty a.m. in the morning. Wow! Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for joining this such uh, early morning. Thank you much, Rodwin, for joining us and giving the support uh, from that part of the globe. Thank you so much. And Suresh Kumar, thank sir, you. please uh, do place your vote of thanks. Uh, thank you, thank you for giving the opportunity. Um, today's speaker is on uh, Saipo Angada did an excellent presentation when you were asking me to attend few of the sessions and a few of the conferences. I felt something it is on uh, um, other field, but today he is the person who explained A to Z. I, I can see that so what are the areas the Saipo Angadagist will play and what are the important components in it and what are the uh, things are there in that, what they can do, what are the things they should not do. Amazing presentation, man. Thank you. Today's presentation. On behalf of the four team members, Mental Health Webinar Series, and on behalf of the Department of Psychology, American College, I record my sincere thanks to you for the great presentation. And thank you, participant, for your amazing support to our initiative. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, participants uh, from Turkey and all over the globe, thank you so much for your love and support. Kindly send your queries and feedback to myWebinarFeedback at gmail.com. Please uh, keep extending your love and support. Thank you so much. Ozan, special gratitude, Rodwin, for you too. No worries. Anytime, Mira. Thank you for inviting. Thank you. Yes. Gracias. Bye-bye.